listening to the PR Wind Down Podcast, the show for public relations professionals who are ready to see real change in the PR industry. We are your hosts, April White and Laura Schooler. Let's get ready to wind down. Carry on, my wayward son. <laughs> do, you, do you want to kick things off today? Start things off today with things I should have been trained on. Yes, except I thought that you had a special thing that you wanted to discuss. Oh, well, I, I do. I do for the segment. Yes. I should have been trained on. Okay, so here we go. How to set the tone for a positive workplace culture when you lead a team? Okay. So basically, did anyone, let me just ask you this, did anyone ever train you, Laura, on how to set a positive workplace culture for when you're leading a team? No, but it's very interesting that you ask that now because in my recent new job. Congratulations. That I started, I know we haven't really talked for a while. The founder of the agency that I work for has asked us all to tell him by, I guess, the end of next week, what culture means to us. And this is his first step towards creating the kind of culture that will suit, you know, everybody at least somewhat. So and, what, go ahead. what does culture mean to you? Let's do your well, on the podcast. So I said something along the lines of the kinds of culture that I have found myself in that was not positive were places that were highly political and, you know, where there were factions in a company, right. us against them. Like high school, mean girls. That, but even I didn't, since I didn't work at that many agencies, at least I haven't worked at an agency for a long time. Oh, right, right. didn't have that sort of vibe. Okay. It was even more like, like, oh, who's more got, like red tape bureaucracy. Yeah. And who's like going to hit the red like button with the nuclear codes, you know, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, yeah. I'm like, I'm just like, are you people crazy? Like, this is just a job, you know, right. like, we're, my God. We're not saving so, the world. Right. So that I would like a culture that's not like that, basically. I see. So you're in, you were informed by what good culture is, by what bad culture right. was. So the opposite right. of that. So not that. <laughs> right. And it's so like anyway. Bad relationship. So, so, right. Right. Yeah. Bad boyfriend. So right. I don't want so, that. Right. So that means I must want the opposite, yeah, opposite of that, of that yeah. <laughs> whatever the opposite of that is I want well, that. and the other thing is uh, I, I think a lot of times places that I worked where people who I worked for were not huge fans of mine it was because they thought I had some like insidious agenda uh-huh and the joke is that my agenda or my approach is that I actually don't have one and I think these people couldn't imagine somebody didn't have so an it's angle. Just, right. So because of course, because some... that's because they do, you know, like how liars think everybody else is lying. Well, mm-hmm. people with like real political, you know, climbing the ladder, you know, kick them when they're down sort of mentalities can't believe that somebody just, you know, goes to work every day. <laughs> they're like, <laughs> Hi, you can't, Bob, figure, out, you can't figure out her angle. What's going on? <laughs> right. And they were like, it must what? be sinister. <laughs> totally. Like, I just want to show up and get a paycheck. Bye. Right. I'm like, you know, here to be a conscientious worker, make things better and easier for everybody. Hopefully, you know, feel like I accomplished some stuff, get paid. So funny. Do a good job, get paid more. And like, and certain (laughs) people's heads. So like, I'm like Peter Sellers and being there. If you've ever seen that movie. Dude, I have. And I had a cat. You're going to love this since you're a cat lady. I had a cat. Her name was Greta. And Greta did not, she was unflappable. Nothing ever got to her. Nothing ever scared her. She didn't have any of the normal cat reactions cat, to right. anything, right? So as an example, one time she escaped from my hotel room when I was in transit with her because somehow the door had flown open when I went to go get one more load of things. 
and I found her wandering through the lobby, just looking up at people, wondering why they were having cocktail hour, <laughs> like she's completely unfazed, not hiding, not scared, just oh like, God. hey, yo, what's up? Like <laughs> just walking through the lobby of all these strangers. <laughs> and then people are like, oh, there's a cat. And she's yeah. like, I'm a cat. So one day she, this is, this is where this gets interesting in this context. So one day she's outside briefly. She's not really an outdoor cat, but she's on the porch. And this other cat comes up to her and is hissing and trying to, you know, fight with her. And right. she sat there, didn't even stand up, didn't hiss, just looked at him with a blank stare like, what's your problem? And that cat was so freaked out that he could have run, right even away. though he could have totally kicked her butt. But she just like, she was like, what gives, yeah. man? And so I feel like that's you, like your that's Greta. Funny. And so the other the other cats are coming up and they're like trying to figure out how to fight with you. <laughs> and you're just like, I don't know what your problem is. I'm just like, uh, okay, uh huh, like, yeah. <laughs> and then they're like, okay, I'm terrified. I don't know what her angle is. Well, and and then, those, but the, the thing with the, like human beings, at least these types of human beings, is they come, would come at me even more and more and more. And I, you know, I, I and I wouldn't. I'd be oh. Sometimes they would get to me though, but, so funny. but but it really was born of the fact that I was just like, well, I don't know. so yeah. So I want you know not that kind of culture. So I okay. suspect you know I'm the oldest person I in the whole firm probably that other people are going to have much much different things because some people haven't even worked in a you know full time job. This is like their first job, and they're going to be like, you know, I I want to have you know massages or whatever it is. You know, it's going to be totally different stuff so funny okay so i think that that is the number one thing is that the culture starts at the top mm -hmm. always starts at the top in any business and it's the same in any team so if you're leading the team and then the other thing is i think you want to make sure that if you want the team to feel supported everything needs to be organized so even if you're feeling overwhelmed and you don't have time to you know, pass the baton, make it right. Like go find a way of getting to the team and saying, Hey, you know, this is how I want this to run. This is who's responsible for X, Y, Z, unless it's already clear mm -hmm. and just making sure everybody has clear roles and responsibilities and they know what the client's looking for from them. And that they're, you know, I think just setting the stage for them helps everyone get on the same page. I think giving them structure and respect and then demonstrating both from the top is, is I would say in a nutshell, the best way to do that. But none of that did I ever get trained on. Well, right. So <laughs> I was going to say, is it bad that I never gave one thought about culture? Because what I was taught is get your ass out of bed, get dressed, go to work and just do your job and whatever <laughs> it is, whatever it's like there, then just deal with it. And if you don't like it, quit. But you better have another no. job. I don't, I think that makes sense. I mean, honestly, I don't think I would have given it as much thought until I started my own because own, then right. I'm responsible for the culture. Yeah. So I have to decide what that looks like. And so then I started, you know, listening to books on tape about culture and, you know, mm -hmm. that's partly why we have the all agency meeting and the way it's structured and the components of it and all of that are sort of informed by some of those. Wow. So you like, you know, didn't just make this stuff up out of nowhere, huh? No, I listen to a lot of books on, well, not a lot, but I listen to a handful of books on tape. A lot sounds like I, you know, that's all I did for eight months or something. That's not true. But I did, I did listen to, to some. Interesting. All right. Well, thanks, April. I mean, thank you, Laura. Jay is on our waiting room. I oh, should well, I can let him in. Just, don't, okay. don't make our guest wait. Okay. Here that's comes better. Jay. Hey, ladies. How you doing? Hey, good. How are you? Great. So today's guest is JJ. He's the founder of Ace of Spades Digital PR Agency, and he's here to discuss why he feels that trust is the most important thing online. So welcome. I was waiting for the so welcome part. I was like, do I jump in? Do I no, not no, no. say anything? <laughs> Laura's, Laura's giving me the look like, is this guy going to talk? No, no. I think Bro we're all just, I think we're all just taken by the dapper appearance and Can I, are we doing video? We're doing video, right? Yes. And if you're not on video, do yourself a favor and get there now. Um, Let's go. <laughs> so, so JJ, by 
looking at you, I had a question yeah. prepared for you. And now that I see yeah, I'm you, not, I think I'm, I know the I, answer. I, 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 but I, I didn't do it. Ask. I didn't do it. I was in Vegas one time. I didn't do it. I didn't. Ace of Spades is the name of your company, right? Yes, ma'am. Are you a Motorhead fan? Mo a Motorhead fan? I'm assuming no. By that answer, I'm saying <laughs> no, hard I'm, no. Like, am I, mi am I missing about? the joke here? <laughs> Motorhead's most celebrated song is called The Ace of Spades. Right. No, let me, let me top that. I was a magician for 15 years. You were not. Is that yeah. why you call it that? Yeah, I was a famous magician. That's how I got to understand the power of PR and branding and trust. That's the story in a, in a 30 second pitch. Yeah, 15 years Where magician. Where were you that magician. is amazing. Yeah, in ever around the world. Yeah, 16 years ago, I wanted to do two things, stand on stage and tell everybody who I am and what I do. And I wanted to start performing. And then magic was, the, was my thing that I put all my energy and time to. 57 million views later, right on YouTube, 30 countries later, I work with the biggest and the best companies about how to give someone a personal experience because personal branding wasn't really a hot word back then. And I think the biggest thing that I learned is if a corporate company like Virgin McDonald's, we call it the Billion Dollar Boys Club. In America, we call it the Fortune 100. If they could trust you, right? And trust you and event planners can trust you, they will always work with you. And it didn't matter whether you're more expensive they just know the power of trust because they have one shot to impress their international guests. They have one shot to reveal the car and you as the host. So eventually that you do an amazing job for them. They're like, we want to book you at every event for the next year because we cannot afford to lose here. Yeah. So that's how you got underway with what you're doing now. So do you do yeah. what you did for yourself now for your clients? Exactly. Yeah. A hundred percent. That's what I do now. You know, my speciality in the game is, is personal branding, you know, personal branding PR. So it's like really selling you, not the product, mm -hmm. right? People are wanting to get to know the product. Humans are buying humans. And, you know, I'm the kind of person, I think this is where trust comes in. I like to sell stuff and pitch stuff and promote stuff that I've done that I know that works. And I've seen work over and over and over again. I just, I just think it's always better to come speak from, from first-hand experience rather than second or third-hand. Mm. Now, to contradict myself, hey, man, Michael Jordan's coach never slam dunked. How could he take Michael Jordan to victory, right? However, I just – I don't really have a good answer for that yet, but I just mm -hmm. know that, like, if I can say to someone, what's it like to be verified? What's it like to grow your account on social media? What's it like to be on television? What's the ROI on getting into Forbes? If I can at least give, like – honest transparency and and first-hand experience in a time now it helped me so much better with with my clients globally so mm -hmm. well actually phil jackson did play in the nba before he oh did he oh well there you go there you go <laughs> but like but you know yeah you're touche but like you know knows everything some... <laughs> about sports and music like you can't yeah. get anything faster not sports everything and music. right i know Almost. that no but i love i love that but someone said that to me once they said well like you know look at not every person is like, you know, done something that they teach. And right. I'm like, you're right. But would you rather, I'd rather just come from a place that I've done it. Mm -hmm. Because then if someone ever says, well, have you done it? Well, not really, but it's like, I, I don't know how to get out of that objection. So can you give, do you have like a case study? Can you, you know, yeah. briefly talk about a client that and what you've done for them? Yeah. Yeah. Well, like, my, my favorite part is turning the spotlight, right? Turning this big spotlight on the person that's made something else famous for so long. So for example, there's a guy named James Somerville and he was the creative director for Coca-Cola for seven years. And he made, he was the guy that when Coca-Cola said, we want to go global, you have the checkbook. I call it the unlimited Coca-Cola checkbook to do anything you want. So he knew how to take a billion dollar company and have all the creators and basically make something cool and and exciting and sell around the world. So when he left that company, got introduced to me and says, Jay, I wanna, I wanna now be seen as a leading designer and leverage Coca-Cola as my, as my case study. So as I call it, I take the spotlight and turn it back on the person that made something else famous. And you guys know this being in PR, like a lot of the times it's, they're not really buying, they're not really hoping to get into Forbes or they're trying to get some new newspaper article. They're really wanting confidence in who they are. That's what I'm selling, yeah. but no one wants to buy that. They're not coming to me and say, here's a lot of money to give me confidence. Hey, I want to have all this. 
but really I'm giving them the confidence to share themselves because for their whole career, they've never shared between their friends. But these guys are the geniuses, guys, all the girls. I love that. Do you ever have people that don't know? I mean, I guess you're, you're helping them figure out what it is, right? So you're drawing them out. But do you ever have people that you just can't find an angle on or, you know, they just yeah, don't? The hook. Yeah. 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 Messaging is really important. You know, I think now, you know, I made the mistake to take on every, like, you know, you do the thing where we all do. Well, I know I did take on, I can take you, take you on. That's ego. Yeah. I can take that client on. No problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course. Then you realize, you know, Tuesday night, you buy yourself. The money's already been spent. They're calling you. I'm like, what have I done here? This is not <laughs> what I signed up for. We've all been there. This client is excellent. And, that, and you know, and you know what, for all the, the, the people that run their own agencies or people working with someone like that, that fault is on you. You have to take full responsibility on that. Right. And I think now it's like getting to your question, getting clear with actually knowing what the client's problem is or helping them under discover that Mm -hmm. and knowing where you fit in their journey of life. Cause we, you know, April, Laura, we're just a, a cheerleader for someone's journey. Right. And you know, we're obviously very involved, but maybe we're not the right place in their chapter on their journey, or maybe they are not even need help with that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you have to learn how to be like, I don't know if I can help you, or I think you're best with this person, or you know what? You need to go and find out who, what you want to do first and be a, don't be afraid to say no, because one thing doesn't work. Have you noticed this too? Like people sometimes think of new clients, they think one Forbes article is going to be the killer. Okay. That's it. I'm out. Forbes is done. Like, let me just, let me just relax. You know? It doesn't work like that. No. It could be it could be press. It could be a podcast. It could be TV. It could be verification. It could be everything. Yeah, and I, That's I don't interesting know. That, it's interesting that you said that some clients are like, "Oh, okay, I did the one article. See you later." I feel like it's the opposite problem where they're like, "Woo! Like now we should be getting one of those like every week." And you're like, "Oh God." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We definitely have that. Yes. Yeah, and so, you know, it's setting setting expectation. You know, and that's just that's always helped me. What industries are, are your clients in? I'll tell you what. Well, I'll tell you what industries I don't like, and I don't take on. I don't take on entertainers. <laughs> I don't take on artists. I don't take on industries that were. In, I call them the sexy industries, it's because a lot of the time, and this is just my perspective, a lot of the times they come with already preconceived notions or yeah. What are you going to do for me, right. Mister Australia? What do you got? I've tried it all. And when you come with a client that's already like that, I'm not in the business of like having to persuade you or force you. If you, once again, coming back to trust, if you 100% allow yourself to trust me, right? Allow, you know, have me in your corner, I'll take you to victory. Here's who I've done it for. Here's I've done it for myself. But there's going to be some things throughout our journey that are going to come up and they're going to be hard for you because that's the hard, that's, that's the part that's going to sell. Yeah. Right. Sometimes entrepreneurs think they can do it all. Well, my sister can write. Of course she can. Right. But that's why she's in real estate and she's not in PR. Right. You know, like my sister mm-hmm. can do a podcast. My sister can buy likes on Instagram. I, I, okay. So why are we having this conversation? Right. Right. You know? <laughs> and so do you help them get verified in things on Instagram, et cetera? Is that part of what you're doing? Yeah, that, that was actually our speciality in the game because I knew how hard it was to get people verified now. Is- very hard how do you yeah what what are the can you share some tips or some yeah it's not just press anymore people think you need to be in very high quality press that is a 90 percent part of it but because we have a relationship with facebook right facebook and instagram they're constantly changing things all the time so for example let's say a client will come to us with press or without press we'll get all the press done right and obviously it's got to be written a certain way your name has to match the press article right also, if your name isn't the same, that's a problem as well. What's your legal name? You know, my legal name isn't JJ, it's Joshua. So I had to make sure my press had Joshua and my last name in the press as well, right? Your, what you do has to be consistent. You can't be an entrepreneur in one of the publications and then a real estate developer in the next. Because you remember, you're trying to give validity to Facebook of you're the person, right? Mm-hmm. So let's say you write all this press and what happens? We go to submit. And then Facebook goes, that, guess what? You know, how living is banned now, you know? Or let's say, you know, a Forbes 
Forbes India is actually not approved for a public figure. Like they'll blacklist it. And now because people, they know that people can just pay to play, the elusiveness of some of the publications have, they just banned them. And they don't consider so if, them at all. No, no way. And then, and then depending on what you're going for, authors are different than actors. Actors are different than sportsmen. Sportsmen are different than musicians. Mm -hmm. Public figures are the hardest. Yeah. And so, yeah. And, you know, back in the day, I'm sure you, you know, you ladies know, it was a lot easier. Could pr press a couple of buttons, you know, do a couple of, maybe do one higher tier publication. It is so challenging now. So after I knew how hard it was for me, I was like, I think I've got a good niche here. I think if I go and I call it, go find the Escobar of Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> who's, who's the kingpin? Let me go, you know. And I like that. Yeah, you know. But I'll tell you what, what is great about verification though, and I think it's the most silliest thing, but I understand. It's like having a Lamborghini Aventador on Instagram. The hottest car, you know, the half a million dollar car. You know, we yeah. ladies, we could all go to a nightclub we can be in a, a Toyota Nissan. Okay, same us, same in, same knowledge, same outfit. Well, people won't even look at us. Right. We go on a Lamborghini Aventador, the brand new 2022 model. The next day, everyone's like, who are they? What do they do? How can I get their phone number? How can they help me? They must be important. Why? Because of that value of whatever that is, mm -hmm. people have made it super big. So same thing with, you know, Forbes and... Business Insider, it's just it's just value. It's just a brand. So are yeah. you telling me I should rethink my um, Buick Century 2003? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but if you hold but if you hold up your phone with the blue tick on verified, they'd be like, okay, let her in, let her in. <laughs> Even though I have an Android. <laughs> yeah, well, fake this still work on Android. But yeah. you always have to think about who is your client and really who are they I speaking agree. to. So yeah. if it's an academic and they show up in a Lamborghini, they won't be taken seriously, right? So it does actually depend. I worked for a United States senator who had this sh car on planet Earth. Yeah. And he did it on purpose. Yeah. Well, yeah. And then as you know, that's 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 like shaking up the market, right? Yeah. It's like that's like that's a, like a hook in itself. <laughs> right. But, but, the, but I mean, I guess I'm just saying that there are different ways to convey mm -hmm. your, I don't Perceive know, value. prowess or your value, depending on yeah. what message you're trying to deliver, you know? Yeah. Is it yeah. reverse you know, snobism? Is it, I'm an environmentalist? Is it, you know, I'm right. wildly rich and famous? Who knows? Perfect segue here. Coming back to trust. What will always win is authenticity. Mm -hmm. Right. It is authenticity. Yeah, that's what it is. Because guess what? Like, yeah, verification, did I get given that? No, I had PR. I obviously had the relationship, so I paid for it. But at the end of the day, right, strip it all away. If I get brought to the table, I know my content and character will win. And, and I think this is the, the, the hard thing I, you know, about our industry sometimes too. It's like there's a big debate about earned media and paid media, you mm -hmm. know, and it's like paying to play or don't pay to play. It's hard because I've done both. I've had both, right? Mm -hmm. But it's sort of like when R&B singers were getting angry at T-Pain. You know T-Pain, the guy who did the voice tunes? Yeah. Remember, remember the guy? Oh, yeah. 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 But T-Pain did extremely well. And then I remember someone coming out and saying, hey, don't, don't hate the play. I hate the game. Right. So this is, you know, this brings up a lot of emotion in our space a lot. Mm -hmm. So Especially, why is yeah. trust the most important thing online? And what does that mean? What is trust online? Trust is everything. The way you make decisions, the way you buy things. It's, it's do I trust the person or do I not trust the person? Do I know you? Do I like you? Do I connect with you? You know? And then I'm making a decision with my time or my money. And then that's driven on trust. Mm -hmm. You know? Now there are different elements of trust. Right. But, I, but I'm, I'm big on with the people that I work with is like how... The faster we can get trust, the faster we can move on to the next part, the next problem. Does, does somebody have to like you or really connect with you yeah, to be able to I, trust you? Yeah, I know where you're going with this. I think there's got to be some kind of likability. I think there's, I understand when people say like, I don't care what anyone thinks of me. Like, I understand what they mean by that. But if anyone's listening, you need to have some kind of likability. Some you don't need to be humanity. sitting, yeah, yeah, hum, humbleness, 
authenticity, relatability, mm-hmm. connection. You don't want people to be turned off. We all know the people that I just don't like him straight away. You know, now they may not get you, but at least they'll be like, at least he's being authentic or she's being authentic, you know? Right. At least she's transparent. I think that's really smart. So how can people get in touch with you? And what do you want to let our, our listeners know about working with you? Sure. Well, well, I'll share with your listeners the, the power of like, you, you mentioned to me, ladies, that you have a lot of people that run PR agencies that are mm-hmm. communication expert. What will always win is, is you. And if I can share one move today, like content will trump anything. So if you can show up and do a bit of content, sharing with your audience about who you are and what you do, you'll, you, they, no one can take that away from you, you know, because you can buy a like on Instagram, you can buy a verification, you can somehow get into followers, but no one can ever say, wow, she's shown up and done a podcast like you ladies every single week last year. That's something that's just powerful stuff. So mm-hmm. Great but if they want to get in touch, yeah, aceofspadesagency.com. That's it, aceofspadesagency.com or DM me on Instagram at jdaylive, J-A-Y-J-A-Y-L-I-V-E. Amazing. And any last questions for us since we put you on the hot seat? Where do you think the PR industry will be in the future? What do you think is going to happen? That's a great question. Laura, do you want to answer? I will start and then I will hand it to you because I don't own a firm, but April does. But I just started working <laughs> as like the second hand woman to a guy. And I was thinking about it today. The more time goes on, the more I see the need for small specialized PR shops. I think that you're much more effective and going back to the trust thing, the days of like the huge PR firm that they send in like the A-team and the suits Mm. And then they leave and then the 22 year old who just graduated last year takes over the account and doesn't know what they're doing. Like that is all over and really having more senior people working full time face to face doing the work, not just sitting back and, you know, taking long lunches or whatever seems to me to be the only way that PR will win in this sort of environment. April? <laughs> I, I agree with you about that the old school way is not working. I don't know that size is necessarily the important part as much as it is making sure you have people that are qualified to work mm-hmm. on the account and that have the expertise. So as you, Laura knows, Jay doesn't know, but we actually curate teams for clients. So I work with people across the country and when somebody comes in, I find the right fit for them. So if they've got multiple stories to tell in different verticals, I make sure that we have a team that can address all of those verticals. And I think that that's a model that could work on a large scale too. I mean, we, we have 31 people. I think if we had 300, I think it'd be the same. It would just need to be, you know, very carefully curated. So you're not just, okay, somebody's available. We have a new client, smash them together, hope it works and makes a great sandwich. Cause usually it doesn't. <laughs> so, yeah. The, so, ju- the jungle approach is not the right approach. Does, just get them all work. into the jungle and let them run around and feed them once a day. Yeah. That's does, not the, that's not the strategy. Doesn't work. Um, my concern about PR is that, and I've talked about this quite a bit in webinars, et cetera, but with the media's credibility starting to plummet, there's a concern that, okay, how do you then get the third party validation mm. that PR has been traditionally used for? I think that it will just morph, right? I think we see it now in social media. You still see it in other traditional forms of PR where, you know, you're sponsoring something that shows your brand essence or you're doing your own you know, content generation, you've Mm. got your own podcast, things like that. I think though, it's important to diversify and not just be relying on the media. And then also looking for media that your audience thinks is credible. Because Mm. if your audience doesn't think, I mean, I'm making this up, but if if you're trying to reach a bunch of Republicans and they don't think Mm. the Washington Post is a valid source of news anymore, then you need to find another outlet, right? (laughs) You need to go to a Mm. different place to find where the audience is going to think that it's cool that you're there. So I just think it's important to keep your eyes open and also be paying attention to what media outlets are starting to come out of, you know, there are lots of Substack writers now, right? And things like that. There are a lot of things that are popping up to fill in the vacuums of a lack of trust in the media. And I think it's important to be watching those spaces carefully and thinking about it, right? And making sure that you're prepared for the future in the event that the mainstream media anyway, continues to kind of lose some of that credibility, but there will still be, Mm. you know, 
ways to get that third party credibility and validation Absolutely. through experts. You just have to, you might have to get more creative. So that's my concern about it. Where I'm hoping to also go with it is in terms of trust relations, we are actually expanding out and doing integrated marketing and communications. And I think that will address some of those issues and some of the pain points that I see with people not being able to feel like there's great ways of measuring the return on investment of PR. And so if you have more integrated things where, okay, you know, you're not ranking high for this search term in SEO, and we then did a bylined article that addressed that by tackling that topic head on, once the article is placed, then your SEO for that key search term that you weren't ranking high for is, is going up. So if you have those kind of integrations, I think it also mm. helps showcase with numbers and that hard data that a lot of marketers and entrepreneurs are looking for because, as you know, PR tends to be on the touchy-feely artistic side. If you know when it works, right. you just know it. You know, And that works for some people, but there are a lot of Wall Street types for which that doesn't work at all. <laughs> and so I'm looking for ways of beefing up some of those metrics so that it inspires their confidence in the, in the art of PR, because it is an art. What I like what you said before is like being creative. PR isn't PR isn't just press, you know, like go back to what the word is, relating yourself to the public. To the public, that's right. Mm -hmm. No, that's, they're all these different. I mean, you can be in committees, you can, yeah. you, know, you can speak at the local government, you know, meeting. Yeah. I mean, there if, are all kinds of ways of doing it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking is huge. That's what I, I that's yeah. one thing I tell my clients to do. They have to, I don't know what we've been going on, but they 30 days that my retainer clients have to do a live every day for 30 days. It's in their contract. And the reason I get them to do that is because one, it gets them out of their head. Two, it teaches them how to engage with an audience because we're so virtual right now. And three, it builds a community. It's funny how the first three to four days, they're like umming and ahhing. I'm like, you have to do it. And it's just never failed me. And then you get on experts and you and then you get their list for free. You can get their viewers. And, and that's a great way to build trust, man. It's great. For sure. Awesome. Well, so, so, so nice to meet you. Thank you so much for being thanks, our Laura. guest. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, April. Thanks, it. girls. All right. Thanks, Bye -bye. guys. Bye-bye. Shall we move on? Sure. Let's move on to our anonymous PR horror story of the day. Oh. All right. I got it. Here we go. Do not open till podcast. Hi, ladies. I have one for you. Oh, boy. Here's the vignette. New client. Small funding announcement. Things only go downhill from there. <laughs> to be honest, this was not an announcement my team was expecting to see any major coverage from. There wasn't <clears> quite <throat> enough meat to it to make a big splash. Then, wow, I love my team. They are so talented. One of my account execs lands a major top-tier publication. We are stoked! For technical reasons, the reporter needed a press release link for the story in advance. So my team hustles to schedule the release, provides the link, aligns with the publication. We get a go live date for the news. And then the night before the announcement, in a moment of half neuroticism and half gut instinct, I make the fatal error of doing one final check of the release. It's 11 p.m. I can't sleep. I find a typo in the headline. So I call the wire service. They make the correction for me quickly. I flag the corrected issue to the client. All is well. I will sleep soundly. Nope. My phone rings. It's the client. Our client contact is the CEO for context. Client says, I'm so glad you messaged me. The new CMO wants to pull the announcement and hold off until we can get a blog post drafted about it. I'm stunned. It's too late. The reporter has the news slated to go live in eight hours. I tell the client we can't contact the reporter so late, and if we did, the relationship would crash and burn. I advise the benefits of a top-tier placement outweigh the benefits of a blog post. Okay. The client agrees. I go to sleep, sweaty, but relieved. The next day, no announcement in the major publication. Oh. Where is it? Did the client call the editor? We email the reporter. Reporter says it's going to delay 24 hours and will run tomorrow. Tomorrow comes. Placement does not appear. 
as it turns out, the editor has killed the story last minute. The CMO is <clears throat> livid. He even threatens to quit. Okay. At the end of the day, <laughs> the CEO understood, but our working relationship with the CMO has been on eggshells ever since. I stand by all of the decisions we made, knowing what we knew, but wow, what an emotional ride that was. I <sighs> want to vomit. That's me, not the story. Yes, that's that's me agreeing with you in real life. <laughs> IRL. Oh my God. I mean, this stuff happens all the time. So you heard what I said when it said the CMO is livid, he even threatens to quit. I said, okay. Like, why would you threaten to quit? Because you're, the reporter that your PR firm got didn't run a story. Like, is why are you threatening to quit the with the relationship with the agency, or threatening to quit? No, his to job? quit. To quit. That I means see. quit your job. Like drama. Right. It's a lot of drama. Like, why would you threaten to quit your job because a story got pulled last minute by an editor? What is that? What? Oh my god. That doesn't even make sense. It's you know. So, it's so horrifying I, the, the the thing that's so annoying so so why is the cmo so annoyed so write the blog post now now it's your big show you should be thrilled you'll be the the, the savior am i wrong i mean i understand the nightmare is that this you know the damn publication didn't run the story after you know delaying it and then canceling it that sucks but what is the cmo's problem i don't know i don't know it's so awful <laughs> like I just want to run away from this horror story. I think. What do you do? I mean, there's, there's nothing, nothing you can do. Nothing. The release is obviously, I guess, gone out right the day and a half before. I mean, the only other thing I guess you can do is just make it clear that for future reference, we need twenty-four to forty-eight hours, or just we need forty-eight hours to make any kind of major shift in an announcement that's already uploaded and worked out with a reporter like you can't say at midnight say kill the story you know if i email the reporter now he's gonna not get the message until the story is already run now the also, story didn't run ruin the relationship right it, uh, it's because you know the cmo wanted to come in and prove his value it's so awful it's it's a nightmare it's a pe but this <laughs> shit happens so to PR people all the <laughs> time, right? It does. <laughs> so what, you know what you do? So now what do you do? So now oh. the, the I, I assume the release is on the wire. So there's oh. no news. You can't give an exclusive to somebody else. It's already on the wire. So you pitch the news the best that you can after the fact. And you also come up with, you know, from this news, what's like an interesting angle that you can now pitch your client to do interviews on the back of, and maybe you write a bylined article out of it and pitch the bylined article to your, or the blog post, turn it into a by, you know, something and pitch that out too. It's so awful. <laughs> <laughs> April has no solution to this. She just, is, she just can't get past the awfulness. <laughs> I like your ideas. <laughs> Thanks. But I can't, yeah, I'm just, I, I just can't. Yeah, I mean, hasn't stuff like this happened to you? Like, oh, for sure. Like that's more why, than once. That's why it's so horrifying. It's right, like, it's oh my god. Yeah. Well, I, I, I had it happen to me, sort of, not that long ago. I think I mentioned it. A, a reporter from a major news said that they were running it and then didn't. The good news was, I think we did it more of a under embargo. Okay. We were giving it to them first. But we told everybody else they could run, you know, an hour later. So luckily everybody else ran. So it didn't kill the whole, you know, right, announcement. Right. But it was Bloomberg. It's like, that would have been great to have a big, you know, 7 a.m. Bloomberg story. Yeah, didn't happen. Oh, it's so rough. And the, and the reporter lied. I mean, it was like such a bad, like, you know, I can't remember what it was. It was like the dog ate my homer kind of like excuse. It was terrible. So bad so bad <laughs> okay all right let's move on i'm like traumatized oh by this story <laughs> okay let's get into our pr news of the week okay so we can yeah let's do it okay so our pr news of the week 
is about how Spotify is responding to their unfolding crisis surrounding Neil Young and Joni Mitchell removing their music from Spotify to protest the platform because of its continued support of controversial podcaster Joe Rogan, who has had some interviews with people about, I guess, vaccine-related questions. And so well, it's been perceived as being anti-vax misinformation. It's more than that, though. He had COVID, and he took ivermectin and all of those things he's talked about it before he and i'm just telling you what he says I'm, you're not agreeing or disagreeing i'm not yeah exactly okay basically what he says is that the real issue is that the people in this country are unhealthy they're overweight and why doesn't the government or whomever tell people how to live a healthier lifestyle to begin with what vitamins you should take take vitamin d take vitamin c which I do actually every day. Because you know, the vitamin companies aren't funding their political campaigns. Well, well right. And I, that's partially <laughs> what he's saying. And like the drug companies, right? They would lose a billion dollars if it was like, take vitamin C, right? So. Same with ivermectin. The reason, there's a lot of reasons it's controversial, right. but it's also the patent on it has expired. And so the pharma companies don't make any money on it. Uh, you know, they'll want you to use ivermectin because they spent millions of dollars producing this new drug that's going right. to save the planet and whatever. So like, Anyway, I'm, so, so again, it's partially I'm not saying part, I, right. I yeah, know yeah. this or whatever. I agree, disagree, but that's the argument for everyone. Yep. Okay. I used to listen to him a lot when he was mainly on YouTube, but since he moved to Spotify, I don't. I just don't I know have, I'm not on Spotify I don't have either. Spotify. I have it, but I don't have it on my phone and whatever. So so I don't know what, what recent interviews he's had, but it sounds like he's had a few where people were anti-vax. Then Joni Mitchell and Neil Young say to Spotify, well, you can do whatever you want. But if you continue to allow Joe Rogan to spew all this anti-vax stuff on Spotify, we're going to take our music off. So they did. Neil Young has made a deal with Amazon since to distribute his music. Joe Rogan has half apologized and says that he will... Half apologized for what? He says he will make more sure to give a more balanced argument, discussion, etc. about this issue. Okay. Spotify's like, you know, we're just a platform and people could say whatever they want. But the problem is, is that they're paying Joe Rogan like a billion dollars. It's like Howard Stern money. So it's not a just more. a guy who has like a podcast. It's the most influential podcaster on the earth saying these things. And he's hugely influential among, you know, ever, a lot of people, I think majority like white dudes. <laughs> and so I think people are like, this is not the same as just like somebody who wants to, you know, talk about alternative methods of but dealing with the virus. he's always had on like very diverse guests. I mean, he's had Alex Jones on more than once. Like, yeah, he has. Right? Like, and he's not path, like a right wing a- lunatic. No, but he's not afraid to talk to them either, which right. is like refreshing, right? Right. Like, oh. But on this topic of this pandemic, he was not towing, you know, the line. And so... So that's right. like the story as I understand it. And what it, a it, position to be in for Spotify. It, by it comes back down to freedom of speech, I think, right? For you, I'm sure. Oh, I mean, always. Yeah. Like you, you know what I'm going to say, right? I don't know. In my mind, Neil Young and Joni Mitchell are like the epitome of like true liberalism. Right, of like old, and so like, it's hippie... like, like old for real hippie, old school right. liberalism. So what's weird to me is that I feel like this move on their part is very illiberal. It's like very judgy for two people that I think of as being classic hippie. Open-minded. Open-minded, like kumbaya, like love everyone, invite everyone into the inner sanctum. Like, it's like, I don't understand how. Yeah. So to me, it speaks to like how strange our universe has gotten because they're my heroes musically. Oh my God. Like I wrote a song that I wanted to be Joni Mitchell-esque. Like these, these are people I really, really admire. I also really admire Joe Rogan. So for me, it's like Mm -hmm. a, it's like mom and dad are fighting and this sucks and make it stop, you know, like, 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 so everyone just right. calm down. Juan, why does this have to be so <laughs> yeah. divisive? You know? So the, the CEO of Spotify, Daniel X said, we know we have a critical role to play in supporting creator expression while balancing it with the safety of our users. In that role, it is important to me that we don't take on the position of being content censor. 
while mm. also making sure that there are rules in place and consequences for those who violate them. I thought that was a very insightful thing to say. I mean, I thought he handled that quite well. And but I it goes back to what I said that like Joe Rogan is, you know, one of the more powerful. He's powerful because people trust him because right. he doesn't censor his shit. Yeah. If he stops doing that, people won't trust him and the readership, right. the listenership will go down and then he won't make any money. So it's but, like. But these people are claiming that he's basically killing people. Okay. So that's why this issue is. Why that's why this issue is so hot. That to I'm me is sort a little of, extreme. Well, but I mean, I think that's what they're standing on. That they say what they if got you don't really get vaccinated, you will die or you will cause other people to die because the people who have died recently and, and I guess through this whole thing have vastly been the unvaccinated. So if Joe Rogan is telling people don't get vaccinated, or his guests are telling people don't get vaccinated, I think that Joni Mitchell is equating that to him killing people i mean i'm simplifying it but i think that's yeah. sort of at the, the guttural bottom of this don't you think that that's why she did it and why neil young i hope so because that <laughs> makes me feel better You're cynical right than that they are doing it some just, money yeah my concern is that they were paid to do it money and att get attention and then get more money yeah yeah well capital society <laughs> but i don't know that i mean it that, feels like a stunt to me i don't know i doesn't feel there's something inorganic about it to me really that's funny yeah when reads, i saw it i was it like oh like neil young i kind of sort of was like oh yeah i could see that i don't know but i mean the unfortunately thing for them now is that of course now they're the laughing stock of a lot of other podcasters and i mean i literally heard a podcast this weekend where somebody had changed the lyrics to old man take a look at my life and like we're making fun of neil young for <laughs> like i shouldn't laugh because i love neil young but it was like it was quite funny like but they, right. he became the law the laughing <laughs> star okay of but the that's entire. okay isn't that okay to make fun of i mean no no i think it's fine to make fun of him i'm just saying in general did they really need to die on this hill did it do any good well if they weren't vaccinated they very well may have died <laughs> Oh my god all right thank you for tuning in for the pr wind down podcast and thank you to jay for joining us for a very high energy interview remember to submit your own agency stories and questions and share our show with your friends and colleagues also if you subscribe and leave us a rating it will help us reach new listeners like you and if you have an anonymous pr horror story of your own please please send it our way at the contact email below the episode notes. We can't wait to wind down with you again next time. I found some good stuff. <laughs> so I've got, I've got some props. I'll share them when the moment have, is right. You have props for today's show. I mean, I always have little props, don't I? I mean, not always like intentionally. Sometimes they just come <laughs> up. Unless, unless you've been doing it intentionally and I never knew. Which is very clever. Well, I have like things just around me. So. Right. No, I, that's my impression as you're just surrounded by interesting things. And then, and <laughs> then I found what? some stuff. Oh, so I see. Can... So it's an intentional. Well, it is oh. now. Okay. Well, no, I found it the other day. And yeah, I guess I was like, oh, I should, maybe I should pull this one out. <laughs>